There have been three words that have given my four children their greatest power over us as parents. They have used them a number of times and even controlled outcomes in our home. I believe they knew the power of them as they got older. And those words either got them something or even got them somewhere. And once I knew that they knew the power and the controlling influence of these words, it began to give me great pause many times in my conversations with them, for I knew that they were listening and they would use it against me. Those three words would challenge my integrity whenever I heard them. And it's not just the language of children with their parents, but I think in a good way it's, God, it's the language of God's children that they need to learn today. In fact, there are three words that get every parent's attention. In fact, I want to even go a little bit deeper and say, if you want to get God to listen to your prayer, you need to learn these three words. Here they are. Ready? But you said. <laughs> How many parents have ever gone through that? That plans have changed and things have gone on. And then you hear those words that challenge your honesty and integrity. But you said we'd get ice cream. But you said we would go here on this date. But you said you'd buy me a dress. But you said those three words, but you said, hold you captive to keeping your word. Think for a moment from the prayer standpoint, okay, our series, remember our series, Because You Prayed. Now get this, because you prayed attached to but you said is a powerful combination for answered prayer. Let me just say that again. If you can connect prayer and adding God's word to it, you have a powerful prayer that's about to go, I'm just telling you, that is about to get answered. When I pray for you in the preaching of the word, I pray with these three verses in mind. I pray over you. I pray that God, I, when I ask for God to take these next few moments, I always pray Jeremiah 5.14 and I say, God, you said that the Lord of hosts says, because you speak this word, I'll make my words in your mouth fire and this people would. I know that's not looking good for you, but I just always pray that. I said, God, let me have fire and turn them into wood and set this place ablaze with the presence of God. I pray Ephesians six nineteen that Paul says that whenever I speak words, that words may be given to me, that I will fearlessly make them the mystery of the gospel known. And then I pray Second Timothy, I always tell God, you said, but the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me. And when I pray for you, I'm always going, God, you said in your word, you said in your word. But you said was the language of a man in crisis in the Bible. Just as because you prayed was a phrase that was used in the Bible, so is but you said. It was these three words that started a man who was in crisis, his prayer. Because you prayed were the words, as we learned last week, of a prophet to a king as the king was in trouble with an army that was way beyond him. But you said are the words of a man in trouble and he's praying to the king of kings. These words, but you said, are from the prayer of Jacob in Genesis 32. Let me give you just a little bit of the context and the story. Genesis 32 is the story of Esau and Jacob getting ready to meet each other after being apart for over 20 years. If you remember the story, Jacob the deceiver has run away from his brother after he swindled him out of his birthright. His brother threatened to kill him, and so Jacob goes to his uncle Laban's home as a fugitive and ends up marrying his daughter Rachel. Now, after two decades, Jacob is making a journey back home, and on his way back, he finds out Esau is about to cut him off on the journey as he's going home. Jacob is getting ready, don't miss this, to face his unresolved past with a brother that he has swindled and deceived. Think about this. And when he finds out 
that Esau is on his way to meet him. It's not just Esau. His, the report came back and said, Esau, your brother's coming. Here's what it says. And there's 400 men with him. He is full of fear and distress, is what the Bible says, describing Jacob. No one knows what this means, but everyone expects trouble at this moment. So what do you do? You're on a journey. God has called you, and we'll get to that in a moment, to leave Laban. And while you're on your journey, the brother you swindled, the brother you never apologized to, the one who swore he would kill you is coming. What do you do at that moment? You have to remember, Jacob's life has been that of deceiving, conniving, scheming, and planning. You would think the first thing he would do in this crisis is to pray. Just like Hezekiah, Jacob doesn't pray at first. Hezekiah negotiates with evil, and Jacob begins to come up with an elaborate plan. Let me just read you the plan for a second, because this has merit for just a moment, um, or this, this has application for something we're faced with as a nation. The Bible says, the messengers returned to Jacob, saying, we came to your brother Esau, and furthermore, he is coming to meet you, and 400 men are with him. I wonder what the tone of that was. I don't think they were going like, your brother's coming, there's 400 people that are coming to greet you. I think it was like, Esau's coming, and 400 men are coming with him. Here's what it says. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed, and he divided the people who were with him and the flocks and the herds and the camels into two companies. Why would he do that? For he said, here comes the scheming. If Esau comes for the one company and attacks it, then the other company which is left will be able to escape. And just so you know, it goes on later to say that Jacob was in neither of these companies. He was way behind. So if anybody was going to get killed, it wasn't going to be him. Here's what is amazing. This week, the United States went on high alert and we're being told that it is that a viable report that Russia right now is working on putting a nuclear weapon in outer space. And Washington, D.C. set this alert out that the Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, came and, and spoke, spoke publicly about, 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 this, about this situation that was taking place. They said the concern was so urgent that the Secretary of State, our Secretary of State Blinken, has asked China and India to try to talk Russia down from putting up nuclear weapons now in outer space. And if I could just give our Secretary of State Blinken a little bit of advice, I would go a little bit higher than China and India on this situation. The US is acting like Jacob. We have no idea what to do, so let's talk and let's come up with a plan with China and India. I think this would be a good moment for the Senate and for the House, for our President and Vice President, for the Secretary of State to go up higher and say, if this isn't that, we need to call on God because we don't know anything to do in this situation. At some point, Jacob sees how hollow his plans are and there is no way out. 400 men, an unresolved past, and he knew that just like Russia's putting a nuclear weapon in outer space, he better ask the help of God. So like Hezekiah, the second thing Jacob does is pray. And this has to always, for all of us, this should always be our first thing that we do. And it's his prayer in Genesis 32 that caught my attention that I think there's so much here to help us in our lives of prayer. Let me read to you the child Jacob is about to call out to his father with that powerful language, but you said. Let me read to you his prayer as he is on a journey, has no way to defend himself, but he knows God has called him, and I want to read to you the prayer of Jacob and what we can learn from this. Look at Genesis 32, verse 9. And Jacob said, O oh God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, O oh Lord who said to me, return to your country and to your kindred. Don't miss that first, those, that first phrase. O oh Lord who said to me. He said, he goes, and then he said this, return to your country. He says, I'm doing this based upon what, you, what your word said to me and to your kindred that I may do you good. I'm not worthy of the least of all the deeds of steadfast love and all the faithfulness that you have shown to your servant. For with only my staff I have crossed this Jordan, and now I have become two camps. Please deliver me from the hand of my brother, from the hand of Esau, for I fear him, that he may come and attack me. 
the mothers and with the children. Here it comes, verse 12. But you said, I will surely do you good and make your offspring as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitudes. Look at those three words again in verse 12. But you said, and in, some pla- in, in, in this prayer, in a sense, twice Jacob prays with these powerful words. You said, you said, you spoke to me to leave. You spoke to me that you would make this nation a powerful nation. Jacob, in a sense, get this down, church. Jacob was quoting God from Genesis 28 and also from Genesis 31. Jacob's prayer, here it is, is quoting God's word back to him. Folks, there is something here that I'm telling you is going to liberate you today. But you said is the response to a crisis. It's facing your battle not only with prayer, but also God's word and believing for God's for God to answer and to intervene. But you said, this is the part I want you to get, but you said is not challenging God, but it's challenging your situation by praying God's word into it. That's what this is. It's not challenging God. I'll get to that in a second. It's challenging your situation by adding prayer and the word together. I don't think Jacob was challenging God's word. I think he was putting God's word into his prayer and into the mess he created and he was about to face. That's what he was doing. My, I personally believe, in my opinion, we have no evidence for this, it's just my opinion, I believe Jacob's prayer changed the encounter that he was gonna have with his brother. Why would Esau be bringing 400 men with him for only to give his brother a hug? I don't think so, because that's what happened. Look, look at it, Genesis 33, 4. Es- when they saw each other, Esau ran to meet him, embraced him, fell on his neck, kissed him, and they wept. I don't think he was bringing 400 men to go, come help me hug my brother. I think he was coming to kill his brother, and I think prayer turned this whole thing around. That's what I believe. Powerful, get this now, powerful prayer is quoting God. But you said is quoting God. That's what that phrase means. It's quoting God. It's the power of the child with the father. It's what our children have done to us. It's what your children has done to you. It's the child quoting God. Aren't you thankful that we are children and he is our father and God doesn't get technical with us like we're on a business relationship? Could you imagine if God got technical every time we prayed? Most of us have learned what, what, what it's like to call a giant organization, nothing bigger than heaven, to call a giant organization and they kick you over to voicemail. And now you're hitting numbers if you, for languages and all this stuff and you're trying to find this. But can you imagine if God installed that in heaven? Imagine praying and hearing the following. Thank you for calling heaven. For English, press one. Spanish, press two. All other languages, press zero. Please select one of the options. Press one for requests, press two for thanksgiving, press three for complaints, and press four for all other inquiries. I'm sorry all of our angels and saints are busy right now (laughs) helping other sinners. However, your prayer is important to us and we will answer it in the order it was received. Please stay on the line if you'd like to speak to God. Press one. Jesus, press two. Holy Spirit, press three. If you'd like to hear King David sing a psalm while you're holding, press four. To find a loved one that has been assigned to heaven, press five. Then enter his or her social security number followed by the pound sign. If you receive a negative response, hang up and try area code 666.
For reservations in heaven, please enter John, J-O-H-N, followed by the numbers 316. For answers to nagging questions about dinosaurs, the age of the earth, life on other planets, and where is Noah's Ark, please wait until you arrive. (laughs) Our computers show that you've already prayed today. Please hang up and try again tomorrow. The office is now closed for the weekend to observe the Sabbath. Please press again. Please pray again on Monday after 930. And if you're calling after hours and you need an emergency help, then contact your local pastor. Thank you and have a heavenly day. Thank God that's not what he does. Thank God that's not how we pray. We've got a Father in heaven that hears us every single time we pray. Hallelujah. But you said is our authority in prayer. The power in quoting God to God appeals to the, this is a big word, I'll explain it in just a moment. The power in quoting God to God appeals to the, this is your theological word of the day, the veracity of God. That phrase is a theological word. The veracity of God means God always tells the truth. That's what it means. That's the veracity of God. Or another way to say it is this. Here it comes. God cannot lie. When he speaks, it's the truth. Listen to it, Hebrews 6.18, it is impossible for God to lie. Titus 1.2, God who cannot lie. That's the veracity of God. That when you quote God to God, you're appealing to his truthfulness, to his veracity. Folks, no better, no better thing to quote to God than to say, but you said. You said in your word. Jacob quotes God his own words back to him, like a child would quote their father back to him. It was as if Jacob knew God always keeps his word. Now, folks, I want to say this to you, and this is so important to many of you that are listening around the country and around the world, and those that are in this place today, I want you to hear me for a moment. Reading the Bible each day helps you pray more effectively. To neglect, listen to me, this is so important. I'll get to this in a little bit, uh, a little bit more. When you neglect this, it affects your prayer life. It'll affect, because what you're doing is you're robbing yourself of God's word that we can be quoting to him and speaking to him. Because God always responds to his word. Listen to it. 1 John 5.14 says it like this. This is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything According to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we have asked, that's prayer, we know that we have the requests which we have asked from him. Do you understand? Look at that first word. If we ask anything according to his will. Folks, here it comes. Get this now. His will is found In his words. If you want to know if you're praying according to his will, just pray his word. That's his will is found here. And when you can do that, I I was thinking of the words, and I was reading this this morning as I was reading a a sermon from many, many years ago from the the great English preacher, Charles Spurgeon, who said it like this. He says, the best praying man is the man who is most believingly familiar with the promises of God. He goes, after all, prayer is nothing but taking God's promise to him and saying to him, do as thou hast said. Prayer is the promise utilized. A prayer which is not based on a promise has no true foundation. So when you ask according to his word, You're praying according to his will. And the promise for everyone that is listening today is, here it comes, he hears us. Folks, if there is any great ground to stand on, it's praying his word. It's it's bringing to God. That's why we've got to know his word. I was reading the story of two men who were talking together, and the first one challenged the other, who were both illiterate in the Bible. And they said, if you're so religious... Let me hear you quote the Lord's Prayer. I'll bet you $10 you can't. The second man said, here it comes. Now I lay me down to sleep. 
I pray the Lord my soul to keep, and if I die before I wake, he said, I pray the Lord my soul to take. And the second man pulled out $10 and said, I didn't think you could do it. (laughs) Which means neither of them knew the Bible. What was Jacob quoting? Jacob went back to two places that God spoke to him. Jacob went back to two places, one in Genesis 28, over 20 years earlier, and then one just just literally, if we would guess, months earlier in Genesis 31. Jacob went back to two places. When Jacob said, but you said, he was taking God's word. He was looking at the word of God and saying, and quoting it back to God. Listen to Genesis 31.3. This is important. I want you to listen to me for a moment on this one. Then the Lord said to Jacob, this is while he was working for his uncle Laban, return to the land of your fathers and to your relatives and I will be with you. Those are God's words to Jacob. Now there's a side note here that I think is so important that I wanna say to, to some of you. I wanna speak this for those that are 40 and younger. And there's a reason behind this. The context of this is God's direction that he's working in a very difficult job. Listen to this. This is how difficult it's been for Jacob. He tells the Laban sons, he says, your father has cheated me and changed my wages 10 times. However, God did not allow him to hurt me. Now folks, I want you to hear this for a moment. Jacob left his 20 year mess of a job because God told him to leave. He stayed even though he was cheated His wages were changed 10 times and there were broken promises. But Jacob, don't miss this because this is for someone today. Jacob stayed until God spoke to him. Okay, here it is now. Get this down. Difficulty is not directional. Difficulty deepens us in Christ. So just because, look at me now. Just because you're in a difficult situation, difficulty doesn't direct us. It's where we trust God even more. Difficulty deepens and matures us. Some of you are thinking, well, it's hard. It must not be God. Some of us who are old like me can tell you that's not true. Because there are tough moments that God says, you're going to stay and you're going to see my faithfulness and you're going to see me stand with you and you're going to see me vindicate in this situation. God's voice moved him. Now, folks, now some of you may not think that's a big deal. You just, you, and I mean, his wages were changed 10 times, broken promises, and he still stayed. Even the Bible says in that same passage that is the countenance of Laban even turned against him. And here's what's incredible, folks. He needed to wait for God to speak to him because of the next chapter he was going through because he was going to come in contact with Esau. Listen, why is this important? When Jacob is about to meet Esau and 400 men, Jacob is able to say, God, you told me to leave. So now it's up to you to protect me in this next place that I'm going to. Listen to me. Some of you can't say that because you left when it was difficult. God was going to deepen you in that place. You aborted your mission. I don't know why I'm yelling at you, but let me just say this. You aborted your mission that God was going to begin to deepen and mature. And because it got hard, because the boss looked at you in an angry way, because you didn't get the promotion or the raise, you go, this must be God. Not necessarily. We are the people of God. We listen to the voice of God. And when God speaks, then we move. Because when we move into the next chapter, I'm able to say, you sent me here. So you better fight for me with what I'm about to face. You know how many times I said that to God when I came to Times Square Church? I said, you sent me here. So it's up to you now to fight my battles. You pointed me in this direction. That's why he says in Genesis 32, 9, Jacob said, O God of my father, O Lord, who said to me, return to your country and your relatives and I will prosper you. So if you told me to go back, you better get me there and get me through these 400 men. 
And God goes, I'll do better than that. I'll get your brother to hug you, kiss you, and make everything right. That's a miracle in itself. You still with me? Some of you going, I can't take 10 more weeks of this. Okay, stay with me. The second prayer is verse 12. But you said, those are the words, but you said, I will surely do you good and make your offspring as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitudes. Jacob went back to something God spoke two decades earlier, right after he fled as a fugitive. Listen to it. This is Genesis 28. Jacob had a dream, and behold, a ladder was set on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. This is where we get Jacob's ladder from. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the land on which you lie. I will give it to you and to your descendants. Here it comes. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth. You'll spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. And in your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I'm with you and will keep you wherever you go. And will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until you have done what I have promised you. That's what he did. And in fact, you know what he did? Once he heard this from God, verse 19 says, he called the name of that place Bethel. Bethel. You know what that name means? House of God. Bethel means house of God. Folks, even maybe on a different note, that's why it's so important, whether you're online watching from around the world or right here in the New York tri-state area, get to the house of God. You don't know when God's gonna speak to you. You have no idea that you may get a word, a scripture, a prayer that you can go back and say, you said to me, you spoke to me. Folks, that happened to me yesterday. See, the first prayer that, that, David, that Jacob got was on timing. It was the timing of God. When finally God in Genesis 31 says, now it's time to go. Not when it's difficult, but it's on my voice. And the second prayer was on purpose. That was the Genesis 28 one. This is why I'm sending you back. And you need to hear both from God. To, to sit there and just go, I'm gonna go do what God's called me to do, but never know the timing, is to get you in a real difficult place. And then just to go without knowing why you're going is also difficult. But knowing that God has spoken to you, even in the house of God, is so important. Yesterday, I was walking through this place, praying over this sanctuary, praying over every one of the seats. And as I was doing that, I got blindsided on Friday with some news that I, that I wasn't expecting. It set me back a bit mentally and emotionally. But while I was in the sanctuary praying yesterday... In Bethel, house of God, in the sanctuary, I was praying the verses and just beginning to quote to God what back to him as I was facing this battle. I told God, I said, you said in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 that you said the weapons of our warfare are not of flesh but are divinely powerful to the destruction of fortresses. And I said, you said to take every thought captive to the obedience of God. And then I started to quote to him, and you said in your scriptures, you wouldn't give me a command that you didn't, I couldn't keep. You quote, I said, God, you said, Philippians 4, 8, that whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good report, whatever is of excellence, think on these things. So God, I'm gonna listen to what you had to tell me. And then I quoted to him. I said, God, you said in Colossians chapter three, verse two, set your mind on things above not on things on this earth, for you have died in your life. My life is hidden with Christ in God. And then as I was quoting and said, you said, you said, you said, you said, then I felt like God even spoke to me and put something in my heart and said, don't you know what's happening? Don't you know why this is going on? He says, when you launched a year ago, biblical worldview, do you remember the attacks that came your way? That's why this is happening. So when you're beginning to, to mobilize the church to pray, don't you think this is going to be contested? Don't you think that you're going to be challenged to yourself in this? And I'm telling you, folks, I walked through this place with liberty as I was quoting to God his own word back to him. Because he hears us when we pray. 
Listen to it again. This is the confidence which we have before him. If we ask according to his will, what does he do? He hears us. And then it says that if we know that he hears us, that whenever we ask, we know we have the request for which we have asked for him. It's the answer to prayer. Folks, th this really is, if I was to ask you the question, what is powerful prayer? What is powerful prayer? It's not yelling, it's not being quiet, it's not crying, it's not sophisticated. Powerful prayer is not praying in King James words, saying thee and thouest and goest. It's not running, laying down, kneeling. Can I tell you what powerful prayer is? It's answered prayer. That's the most powerful prayer there is. It's when God steps in and answers that prayer. See, John calls it having the request which we've asked from him. Answered prayer is what makes it powerful. It's what we stand on when we pray this. I was reading the story of the lady who was known for her faith and boldness and talking and talking about it. But God somehow put her house near an atheist house. And so she would do her morning devotions on her back porch every morning. She'd come out and praise you, Jesus. Praise God. And the atheist next door was getting so angry every morning listening to that lady over and over again, praying to a God he said doesn't even exist. Finally, he got so upset. He says, there ain't no God. The lady stood on her porch and just yelled louder, praise God, praise God, praise God. She said that one day she came out and said, God, I need food. I'm having a hard time. I've lost my job and I need groceries. And the next morning, the, the atheist had this idea. He said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go out and buy her the groceries. <laughs> so he went out, bought the groceries and put it on her porch and all of a sudden, she walked out as she does every morning, and she just goes, praise God! You provide. And the atheist jumps and says, ha! God didn't provide it. I provided it. And all of a sudden, she started jumping up and down. He said, I praise you even more. Not only did you get to send me groceries, but you had the devil pay for them. <laughs> Hallelujah! Answered prayer is powerful prayer. And for those that didn't hear the testimony of one of our leaders that's watching right now from our Jersey campus, Steve Barrett, during prayer and fasting, let me recount answered prayer to you for just a moment. Steve Barrett on Monday night when we were praying for healing stood on this stage. And I'm gonna just, I literally just typed out what he said. This is no embellishment. This is what Steve Barrett said on this stage on Monday night of prayer and fasting. He said, I've been coming to this church for 28 years. He says, I went to my normal physical and I got bad news on my yearly physical. The doctor said to me at the end of November 2023 that when we did your EKG, the doctor said, Steve, we have a big problem and it doesn't look good for you. Several of your arteries have severe blockages. He said, in fact, I'm calling your wife right now and you are to go without, any, without any type of delay to a medical facility 15 minutes away for further testing. And when he got there, the results were even worse. They said, all of your arteries are clogged. You need to have, I didn't even know this existed, quintuple bypass surgery. Every artery is clogged. When we spoke at our Jersey campus in December and talked about a coming storm to our nation, and that our Jersey campus was going to be used as a command center for food and for mercy and, and ministry, compassion ministry that would come from Pastor Brad and Lisa Geis as they lead that great campus in Jersey. That whatever happens in our city, we have a, a command center in Jersey. We decided that night, myself and the elders, that we would pray for Steve. And I remember praying for him that as he came on the stage... I remember, because when I pray for people for healing, this is what I've said. I said these words. I said, we, we anointed him with oil, and I said this. I said, God, your word says in James chapter 5, if there's, be any, if there's any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church. They will anoint him with oil, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. And then as we started to pray for him, I know what I said. I said, God, your word says in Isaiah 53, it gives us the authority to pray that by your stripes you are healed. 
This is what we heard then Steve say. Steve stood up here and said, when I was prayed for, I felt something hit my body. Steve, a few days later, went back to the doctor to get ready to schedule surgery, and they said, we've got to do some prelim test, and this is, the le- this is what he started to say what happened. He said, when they were ready to do the preliminary test to see the extent of the damage before they scheduled the quintuple bypass surgery, he said, during the 90-minute procedure, he said, I was under under a a local, but I I still knew what was going on. He said, 90 minutes into it, he said, the surgeon looked over the table into my eyes. And he goes, Steve, we're done. He says, I can't put in you one stint. Your arteries are completely clear. Now, folks, and then his doctor, and I wrote it, As he said it, his doctor wrote this letter as the band begins to come. Well, don't come yet. No, stay stay there. (laughs) He wrote this letter. Steve Barrett is a patient who recently had a CT angiogram demonstrating multiple obstructions through his coronary arteries. He was placed on preventative medications and referred to cardiology for cardiac catheterization and possible intervention and open heart surgery. And then he says this, he said, he sought spiritual support from his pastor and church before undergoing his, that means he prayed, before undergoing his procedure and was found to have no blockages or lesions in any arteries at the time of the cauterization. Now here's the part, this is it, you got to hear this part. And Steve said this to the church, he says, now you got to be quiet and listen to this part. So I'm going to use the Steve Barrett thing, be quiet and listen to this. The doctor said, this is in a letter. I saw the letter. To the best of my professional knowledge in 29 years of practice and experience, there is no scientific explanation that substantiates how a patient with multiple obstructive lesions in every coronary artery suddenly disappears in matters of weeks. He goes, there is no treatment known to science that will result in this phenomenon. That's from the doctor. So let me just help you as you kind of just gave your little golf clap. That's called Jesus. That's what that's called. That's called Jesus stepping in and working a miracle. I'm telling you folks, if we can get this right, listen, let me just skip this. Now you guys come. Come, the, the people who play the instruments, come. Now listen to this. Let me just skip to the end here, and we, we'll get all this later and buy the book in August. That's not going to sell is what they tell me. So let me just say this. He is my father. I am his child. And all I want to do is say, Father, you said, you said, you said. Here's what I want you to start doing, whether you're praying with people on the phone, praying with people at the altar of this church, praying in your apartment, underneath the sanctuary, praying on a subway. I want you to get these words inside of your soul because it's good faith ground. We need to start learning how to pray this way because when you do, prayer prayer gets powerful. When you do, you get God's attention. And when you do, your faith will increase. So what you're going to do is this. Folks, I have to just say this to my, to my production team. You're going to have to go all the way over to the end of point three. I want you to be able to say these words. You said no weapon formed against me shall pray. Hey, get your phones out and start. So what you're going to do is you're going to take pictures and hold a hand up worshiping is what you're going to do. So this, I'm, I'm going to give you some prayer language. Here it comes. You said no weapon formed against me shall prosper. You said when the enemy comes in like a flood that the spirit of God shall raise up a standard. You said greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. You said by your stripes I am healed. You said we are more than conquerors. You said if God be for us, who can be against us? You said the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are saved. You said I will never leave you nor forsake you. The Lord is my helper. I will not fear what can man 
do to me. You said, God is my refuge and my strength. Hallelujah. A very present help in time of trouble. You said, I will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. You said you would put angels around me and protect me, hallelujah. Oh, here it comes. You said if I give tithes and offerings, the windows of heaven would be opened up and blessing would be poured out. Woo! You said you'll pass through the waters and I will be with you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. You said, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. You said, whatever we ask in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. You said, call unto me, and I will show you great and mighty things, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. You said, quoting God to God. You're quoting God to God. There, there, is a, there is an old hymn that some of you remember. It used to go like this. It goes, standing on the promises of Christ my King through eternal... Oh, I got the wrong... I'm going I'm to go too high on this. Give me that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Standing on the promises of Christ my King through eternal age. Glory in the highest. Okay, get ready now. We're going to go like this. Standing. both online and person you need God to intervene in something you're about to intersect with something that you need God to step in right now how many need that right now I, can we get to that chorus that you did I'm calling on the God of Jacob let's go to that chorus part in just a second if that's you here's how we're gonna close like Jacob 
his unresolved past was about an intersect of 400 men. I totally believe that 400 men were going to take Jacob and all of them out. And somehow God turned the whole thing around. Why? He was praying on the promises of God. Praying on the promises of God. Balcony, main floor. You need God to go before you. You need God to go before you. And I just gave you fuel. I gave you what to quote back to God. You said, when my enemy comes in like a flood, God will raise up a standard. You said, though I walk through the waters, you'll be with me. And if I go through the fires, I will not be burned. You said, and, and I want you to take those promises even start now to get out of your seats to walk down here and say, God, I need you to show up. I need you to show up. We need to, this is not a sermon on prayer. This is because we need to start praying quickly. Get out of your seat. Balcony, get out. Just get out. Get out. Don't, don't. Wait. Come on, let's sing that chorus of that. Sing oh, it. God, my God, I need you. Oh, God, my those hands and just start quoting to him said you said you said tell him right now no weapon formed against me shall prosper you tell him right now out loud you said greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world would you declare to God right now out loud you said by your stripes I'm healed tell him right now choir you declare it right now by your stripes I'm healed you said you said by your stripes I'm healed you said if God be for us who can be against us you said the name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous will run to it and they are safe. You said, you said I will never leave you nor forsake you. Tell them right now. For those that are having mind battles right now, for those that are having my battles, tell them right now. Just tell them, just say, you said you will keep me in perfect peace whose mind, just tell them right now, you'll keep me in perfect peace right now. You'll keep me in perfect peace. For those that are afraid of where you live, tell them right now, you said, you said, you would put angels around me at my campus, at the school, at my apartment. You said you would do that. Come on, tell them. You said God is my refuge and my strength, a very present help in time of trouble. You said I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will not fear what man can do to me. Hallelujah. For those that are dealing with a bondage, they declare right now, you said, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, just praise him right now. Just thank him for his word. Thank him for his word. And Father, these incredible people at this altar, these precious people, you said, if you call to me, I'll answer you and show you great and mighty things. I pray start the great and mighty things when people leave this place. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on, Times Square. Call upon him right now. Just call upon him. Lift those hands and call upon him. Lift your voice and call him. Whatever scripture comes to your mind, quote it to God. You said, you said, you said, you said, oh God. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, 
Hallelujah. You said in your word, oh God. You said it. You said it. I believe it. You said it. I believe it. Oh, hallelujah. Now listen. Before we leave this place, we're going to have our prayer teams come up. Elder Vicki, could you get us to that bridge? You said, I believe. In just a moment. Oh, sing it for a moment. You said, it is done. You said, I believe. You said, it is One more time, one more time. You said. that as people getting ready to pray but here I, I can't leave without this because it's part of what we believe listen to this for just a moment you said you said this about salvation you said this about salvation that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead you will be saved. Put that on the screen for me, would you please? Thank you. You said, I know there's poor production people, I'm going back and forth. There's a song, they didn't expect any of this, so I'm, I, I, I get it. This is so important. You said this about salvation. If you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised them from the dead. What is that, those last four words? You will be saved. What happens? For with the heart, person believes, resulting in righteousness. With the mouth, he confesses, resulting in what? Okay, and here's what it says. For the scripture says, whoever believes in him will never be disappointed. And whoever calls on the name of the Lord, hallelujah, will be saved. So look at me for a second. Online, look at me. Look at me. Those that are watching from the UK and the Netherlands, those that are watching from Hong Kong and Singapore, those that are watching from Gabon, and those that are watching from Burundi and Nigeria, listen to me. This is what it said. Because let me tell you what the enemy is saying to you. You did this. You can never be saved. That's not what the scripture says. That's not what the Bible says. But you, but you did. I did this. I used this name in vain. That's not what the Bible says. You said, you said, if I confess with my mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in my heart, you will be saved. So here's what we're going to do. Can I just help you? Don't be offended at this. I'm including myself. We're all liars. None of us tell the truth the whole time. None of us do. Some of you are offended. Makes you the biggest liar. Okay, just understand that. We're all liars at some point. The only one that tells the truth is God. And he tells it all the time. So here's what he says. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God has raised up, you will be saved. It's the word being born again. You get a brand new start. Every head up, everybody looking around. We're gonna do that very thing right now. You are part of a billion souls coming to Christ. If you're here in the balcony, main floor, annex, watching around the country and around the world, we're going to confess with our mouth, Jesus is Lord, and say, God, come in and change me. Save me. I want to be born again. If you're here today and say, Pastor Tim, I want to be saved. I want God in my life. I want God to change me. I want to, I want to be changed from the inside out. If that's you, without any hesitation, say, when we pray, I want to be part of that prayer. Hold your hand up as high as you can. Hold it up as high as you can. Look at all those hands in this place. Keep them up as high as you can. See you guys. God's going to do something with you. I saw you when you guys came down. He's going to do something. His word, his word is stronger than the lies that are striking you. Are you from here? Where do you live? Uptown. 
Is this your first time here? How did you get here? The subway. No, I mean like, how, how did you hear about the church? You've known about it your whole life, but your first time, and you came today. Your wife has cancer. You have cancer. Stage three. You have a scary week with doctors that are coming up. What's your name? Liz. You said, by your stripes, I'm healed. Come on, stretch out your hands for Liz right now. You brought her today. Send a miracle. Send a miracle for Liz today. Your word says, by your stripes, we're healed. And we believe that for Liz. Stage three cancer, be healed, be gone in Jesus' name. We stand as a church because you said, you said, of all the Sundays for this couple to be here, this was the one you wanted him to be here. He wanted you here for this day. And we're gonna believe for a miracle, a miracle in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Now those online and in person are saying, I want to be born again. Raise your hand right now, quickly. Hold them back up. Hold them back up. All those hands. Keep them up. Declare this with me out loud. Come on, let's declare this. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you're the Son of God. I believe that on the cross you took my sin, my shame, and my guilt, and you died for it. You faced hell for me so I wouldn't have to go. You rose from the dead to give me a place in heaven, a purpose on earth, and a relationship with your Father. Today, Lord Jesus, I turn from my sin to be born again. God is my Father. Jesus is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my helper. The Bible is my God. And heaven is my home. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen and amen and amen.